further ado, I'll hand over to Professor Alan and we'll hear all about Net Zero and what we should be doing. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me to uh, present uh, from my book. Uh, I'm most grateful and it's good to, to talk to you all. Um, rather than sort of uh, try to go through the uh, step by step of the book, let me start off by explaining why I've written the book and what its motivation is. And then I'll just try to pick out some of the key themes and i um, happy, of course, to explore any of the dimensions and questions, etc. So I thought I'd finished writing about climate change quite a while ago. I wrote a book called The Carbon Crunch back in 2012, uh, asking a, a, a pretty simple question. Why had so little been achieved despite so much money being spent and so much political capital and people's commitments uh, being uh, put to the challenge of climate change? And um, back then, there were people who believed in crazy things like peak oil uh, and um, the belief that uh, oil prices would be going up to $200 a barrel and um, uh, renewables would all be in the market and therefore government didn't really need to do very much. It was going to happen anyway. Um, a bit further down the track, because people persisted with the idea that our future energy world was one of high fossil fuels, prices, providing this uh, safety net for uh, the uh, renewables and even nuclear power, uh, I wrote a book called Burnout and looked at the uh, future for the fossil fuel industries and in particular painted a picture of a gradually falling oil price through time. And uh, if we really do get to genuine net zero, the oil price will be pretty close to the floor. Um, marginal cost five dollars or whatever and try to explain what that meant for the costs of the transition going forward and what would happen to big oil as decarbonisation took place uh, and talked about um, whether the big oil company should harvest and exit, try to turn themselves into something completely different, i.e. renewables uh, companies um, or just stick to their knitting and carry on as if nothing was happening. So I did that and I thought, as I say, I'd said what I wanted to say about climate change. But then along came net zero, and in particular, uh, a report by the Climate Change Committee uh, in 2019, seems a long time ago now, but it's not that long ago, in which at the outset, the Climate Change Committee, right at the beginning of the document, made this claim. And, and uh, I'll just read you the, the two lines of this claim, and then I'll tell you why it provoked me to write a book. So it says, by reducing emissions produced in the UK to zero, we also end our contribution to rising global temperatures. It's completely wrong unless you believe that, A, we should eliminate all emissions, zero emissions, not net zero, zero emissions, and worse still, it's wrong unless you believe that everybody else is also going to achieve net zero in 250, which they clearly aren't. Even China's offered uh, the last couple of days to get to so-called carbon neutrality by 260 isn't 250. And I wanted to explain why this is misguided. And it's really important to recognize that when the government adopted a net zero um, target and amended the Climate Change Act, it set in place a unilateral carbon production territorial target. And this really matters. It says, we're going to do it, whatever anybody else does. Okay. And the British public, many of whom are very supportive of addressing climate change, and I'm passionately in favour of dealing with climate change and addressing it, I do think they expect that in going through all the measures they're going through, that it really is going to be true that they're not causing climate change anymore. And my reaction to that, if only, because the truth about climate change is an obvious one. It's global. It doesn't matter where a tonne of carbon is produced. 
whether it's produced in China, Africa, India, or in Belfast, or in Southampton. It's just irrelevant, okay? So if you look at an economy like the UK, and you ask the question, how could it be true that we unilaterally are gonna act in such a way as to no longer cause climate change? Then what we have to look to is not whether the emissions are produced in Britain, but what our carbon consumption is. And therefore we have to look at the mix of uh, what we consume as individuals, because companies only exist to provide stuff for us, and whether it comes from a Chinese steel mill or from a British steel mill here is irrelevant other than which one has the car highest carbon emissions. And so you can see the obvious let out to this. And this is what's been going on since uh, 1990 throughout Europe and in the UK. We're all deindustrializing. You know, we're 80% services. You know, there are no major new energy intensive investments that I know of taking place in Europe at all. Uh, I'd be delighted to find a counter example, but I keep uh, tossing this out to see if anyone can come up with one. It's not that everyone's immediately leaving, it's just all the investments in energy intensive stuff and carbon intensive stuff are happening in the United States through reshoring from China and China. So when you think about it, and particularly when the Climate Change Committee came out with this report, you know, you can see what's going on because at the same time, the press and the public and politicians were discussing whether British steel was going to collapse and close. Well, if what you want to do is unilaterally reduce your carbon territorial production to hit your net zero target, bring it on, close it as quickly as possible. Indeed, close the Ineos plant in Grangemouth of petrochemicals and um, hope that Brexit kills off the car industry because this is a really good way of getting emissions down. And of course, in the process, you cause higher emissions globally and more climate change than would otherwise have been the case. So if you genuinely want to be net zero, and you by that you mean, and by the way, net zero, not zero, um, our world is made of carbon, we're made of carbon, we don't want zero carbon, we want net zero carbon. But if you genuinely want to feel that you are no longer causing climate change, then it's pretty obvious. You have to include your imports and your domestic consumption, and you have to look at your carbon uh, consumption as a whole. And in my book, to illustrate what really net zero carbon consumption means, I suggest to people that they just try hypothetically to write down their daily carbon diary and think of all the things they consume in a day and have a guess at how much carbon's in them. And I bet you won't immediately notice the palm oil that's in virtually every part of the agricultural production line. But that comes overwhelmingly from rainforests cleared, which were sequestrating carbon, and particularly the great rainforests and in Southeast Asia. Okay? I bet you they don't notice the, the uh, trees that come down and the paper mills and the, um, uh, 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 and the wood products and so on, which end up in everything from the loo paper you probably use first thing in the morning, right through the packaging that your Amazon package arrives at. And that's before you get to the fast fashion and the clothes and your shoes and then the transport you use and oh, and the flights you might take as well. You know, if you want to fly from California to Oxford Circus to appear in a, a boat in a, dem in a Extinction Rebellion demonstration. Well, I'm not against that, but if you wanna fly there and fly back again, do realize just how big your carbon footprint is. And if you wanna demonstrate about dealing with climate change, don't stand on a demonstration line and then go for a cheap package holiday in Spain or Greece. And if you're a child, don't go with your parents on those journeys. These are the kinds of things which are at the heart of your consumption. Of course, steel lies behind this, petrochemicals lie behind this, aluminium lies behind this, fertilizers lie behind this, uh, steel and so on. Um, and by the way, that stuff isn't produced here in the UK. So what you do by focusing on carbon production rather than carbon consumption is you artificially help other countries export to us to the disadvantage of British uh, manufacturing and British energy intensive activities. Now I have a solution to that because I do think it's perfectly plausible and I explain in the book how you can be net zero on a carbon consumption basis, but you can't leave imports out. 
And that leads to the central worry that I have. You know, the only thing that matters in climate change is the concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. And the concentration of the carbon in the atmosphere is the combination of two things. It's the emissions going up into the atmosphere and it's the natural world taking those emissions back down. And for the last millennia, for the last millions of years, nature has balanced uh, emissions to produce a relatively stable uh, parts per million of carbon in the atmosphere. And so what climate change is about is taking that number from 300 and something to 417 already and heading well towards, in my view, 500 parts per million. So what we're interested in is that stock. Now, if you go back to 1990 and ask yourself, you know, when all the people sat around in the UN and uh, they'd listened to Mrs. Thatcher's speech in the late 1980s about um, how the globe had to, how the world had to address climate change, and they sat down and they put together the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change and started the Kyoto Paris uh, Conference of the Party COP um, processes. Um, if you told them back then, you know what, 30 years later, you'll have made no progress at all. That every single year since 1990, two parts per million would have been added to the um, uh, concentration of carbon in the atmosphere. That not even the financial crisis in 2007, 2008 had made any difference to the parts per million in the atmosphere, or even so far the coronavirus. You would have been horrified, but that's true. And that makes me angry from the perspective of caring a lot about climate change. How did we waste 30 years and all the effort, all the money, all the political capital and all the uh, goodwill and moral commitment that people have made to try to make a difference? And the answer to that process is to ask, where did that increase of carbon um, uh, concentration in the atmosphere come from? Well, there are some pretty straightforward answers. In any answer, the word China and the word China and the word China has to keep coming up. It's half the total world coal burn now. It's building more power stations, coal power stations now, than the entire coal capacity installed in Europe now. Of course, it says in 260 it's going to go carbon neutral. But, you know, this is political. This is a, a play for a date when even the current leader of China won't still be president, um, to split the US from Europe in the negotiations going forward to COP26. Of course, you can pitch in anything you want to pitch into this process if you're promising for 40 years from now that it might be delivered. That isn't quick enough. That isn't good enough. We've not even got any idea when China's emissions are going to peak. Okay, So that's part of the story. And what is the Chinese emissions for? Well, it's changing a bit now, but the great expansion of China has been export oriented energy and carbon intensive goods. Just like Japan's great industrial expansion was, just like Korea's was, that's the kind of transition that you make for an emerging economy with an export sector. All very sensible from an economic growth perspective, but who bought it? Well, us in Europe, and the Americans, you know, that's the market, that's 50% of world GDP. And the corollary of that is that those industries have ceased to exist in the UK, except at a minor level. Uh, they've been heavily reduced in Europe, and they've been somewhat reduced in the United States, subject to the arrival of cheap energy in the United States through the form of shale oil and shale gas. So we've got 30 wasted years out there, and my aim in the book is to explain how to make sure we don't waste another 30, because otherwise, and I buy the science on this, we won't fry by 250. But uh, recall that uh, the evidence looks like that in the next five years, we will cross uh, on occasion the 1.5 degree warming point. We've already done one degree. So, you know, when they arrived at Paris, and sat down and couldn't put together enough pledges to meet the two degrees target, they threw in the idea, well, then let's change the target to 1.5. You just couldn't make this stuff up. 
And of course, we're not going to achieve stopping at 1.5. We're going to cross that in the next decade coming forward. So the path is pretty clear as what's going on. And this adds the other component of why we failed, because we've neglected the natural environment and natural capital and natural carbon sequestration. Worse, we've been destroying the capacity of the natural environment to absorb carbon, witness the burning of the Amazon, witness the burning of Siberia, and witness the permanent fires in Indonesia to clear the land for things like palm oil. And we have to address both of those dimensions, but we don't address them, we the citizens of the United Kingdom or any particular country, if we simply close our eyes to imported carbon and just focus on domestic carbon. Doesn't mean we shouldn't reduce emissions domestically. That's important, but we should do it on a consistent basis. And so what I suggest as to how we could uh, make things better and do a better job is three core building blocks or steps to what I regard as a no regrets uh, policy framework. The first one is you have to price carbon. You know, not to price a massive externality is to create a huge inefficiency in your economy. An efficient economy, um, and I'm sure the IA will appreciate this, is a world in which all externalities are internalized. So it's the right thing to do. It's better to tax pollution and subsidize public goods than it is to tax labor and sales and all sorts of other things. You might have to tax those as well but this is a sensible thing to do. We should price pollution. Unless you price pollution, you will not discover uh, the options that are available. And we, do, we don't know, and I don't mean me personally, but the government doesn't know, the Climate Change Committee doesn't know what the optimal uh, carbon emissions path is, and they don't know what technologies are gonna be. The market is a process of discovery. If you put a price out there, we'll find out where the cheapest emissions reductions are. And by the way, they're in agriculture, I guess, because agriculture is 0.6% of the economy. It's 11% of recorded emissions, but if you add the soils and the peats, et cetera, it's probably much worse. It's the biggest polluter by miles. And since it's pretty insignificant in economic terms, the cost of getting those emissions down is likely to be lower than elsewhere in the economy. But further out in the 230s, 240s, who knows what technology be out there? In my lifetime, I started doing my DPhil thesis on Olympus portable typewriter with Tipex and carbon paper. If you told me 30 years later, I'd have this amazing computer in my pocket, which is more efficient and effective than the computer system of Oxford University in 1980, I, I wouldn't have known about that. So how do you know what's gonna be out there in 240? You want to incentivize it. That's what the price mechanism does. And you want the price to be common across all the economy and not just sector by sector or special deal by special deal, which governments love doing. But the carbon price must apply to all carbon. That's why a carbon border adjustment is utterly essential. That's what transforms a net zero carbon production target into one that is a net zero carbon consumption target. And it's crucial. And people say, oh, you know, that's just protectionist. Rubbish. It's not protectionist. Not to have a carbon price is to distort trade. And to have a carbon price domestically, but not at the border, is to subsidize Chinese exports. And that increases climate change relative to the production that would take place at home. Now, people say, you can't do carbon taxing. It's politically impossible. Well, I have two answers to that. The first one is any other route is more expensive. It's not a sufficient condition to have a carbon tax, but it is necessary. And if you don't have one, it will cost you more. It'll be disguised in the price of different technologies that we pick, etc., and the kinds of discrete um, uh, regulatory interventions that will be required because it's more expensive to do that than to use the market signal taking forward. And you'll lose the opportunity to have a proper market in carbon offsets for the natural capital sequestration side of the equation. So it'll cost you more. And that leads to the second unpleasant reality, which is if you haven't priced your major externality in your economy, 
then you're living beyond your environmental means because you are imposing pollution for future generations to pay for without you incurring the cost. And that's the difference between a sustainable economic growth path where externalities are included and one that isn't. And if people say, well, we're not going to pay that, fine, then don't kid yourself, you're going to address climate change. And don't present the argument, oh, we're going to be uh, no longer causing climate change. Well, if you're not prepared to pay the price of changing your lifestyle to one that's lower carbon rather than higher, which is what a carbon tax would do and what's required to meet the target, then be honest, you're not actually going to meet the target. Stop wasting your time. But I take it seriously, we are trying to deal with this. We have got to address the climate problem, biodiversity losses, etc. cetera, a great environmental crisis. And it does require getting onto a sustainable consumption path. So that's number one, the carbon price, and that's essential. And I don't know any economist who genuinely thinks that a carbon price isn't supposed to be part of this, but it has to be at the border too. And it's not as difficult as people say, if you can apply the price to uh, the British steel mill, you can apply it to uh, the carbon that arrives on Southampton docks. And of course, the carbon border adjustment has one fabulous advantage over the Paris type process. If you're China and you want to send steel and it arrives in Southampton dock and an official turns up, having checked all the other documentation on our trade border, and by then, presumably they'd be pretty good at this, having a lot more practice. Um, if it arrives there, the Chinese government has then got to pay money, if it owns a steel mill, to the British government. So it might say, hey, how can I avoid paying this tax? Well, the answer is very straightforward. Come with an exemption certificate because you've introduced a carbon tax at home. This is the pluralization of a carbon tax globally. And if the United States was to go down this route, which I think is very plausible in its disputes with China, you can see how other countries will adopt uh, carbon taxes to pay their own government rather than to pay the British government. So this bottom-up approach to global progress on climate change is hugely potentially more productive than is the top-down idea that all, all the great leaders will sit in a room and fix the global problem, if only. So that's the carbon price. Now there are two other bits okay, to this frame. The second bit is all about the infrastructures for a decarbonized economy. Infrastructure does not spontaneously appear. Infrastructure requires government to have some role in specifying what's required. If you take the electrification of transport, uh, which I, I think will require major network changes, that isn't going to be produced by competition in the sense of deciding the overall outcome. But what can be done is setting in place what it is you want to achieve and then auction to the private sector to deliver as much of that as possible. And in my cost of energy review I carried out for the government, I set out how to take the system operator functions away from the transmission system, uh, 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 transmission companies and from the regional electricity companies and set that as essentially a platform with the duty to ensure that the system meets the carbon budgets and also the security supply, and then auctions those to whoever can provide at lowest cost. But that infrastructure won't happen spontaneously. Questions about hydrogen infrastructure, electrification of transport infrastructure, and of course the fibre networks behind it will not optimally be provided uh, by the private sector on its own. That's indeed why we're uh, the government's involved in pushing fibre out further to the peripheries. And this has to be done, and it's a good thing to do. And hey, you know, if you look at the state of our general infrastructures, nobody would relocate to Britain uh, in order to come for our fabulous infrastructure. So we've got to do this infrastructure stuff anyway to modernise the economy. Let's do it properly. And that's a core part of the Net, uh, uh, net Zero programme. Now, the third bit is to get really serious about carbon sequestration. Okay. As I said, you know, climate change is the balance of taking the emissions out, taking the carbon out, and putting them in the atmosphere. We're going to do stuff about taking them out of the atmosphere, hopefully, but we've still got to deal with the um, uh, sequestration. So the first thing to do is stop wasting money letting the natural environment emit more carbon. And the worst example of this is the impact of the common agricultural policy on our soils, 
Soils have four times the carbon of the atmosphere, and we've been stripping out that carbon extraordinarily. Anyone goes to the British Fens and sees the carbon peak blowing off, you can see what's equivalent to a lot of coal power stations in action. Okay? And of course, carbon in the soil is one of the best measures of biodiversity in the soil, and it's also in the interest of the long-term long productivity of that soil. We must stop the peat bogs hemorrhaging carbon into the atmosphere. And then globally, we really have to think seriously whether we want to buy beef from cleared rainforest in the Amazon uh, um, when we come to trade negotiations. But on top of that, we need to start paying, this is the opposite of the carbon tax or the, the, the corollary of it, we need to start paying for the carbon offsetting functions that the land can provide. And that's where we need a proper carbon offsetting market. We need a baseline of natural capital to work out the starting point. And then we work out from that to work out enhancements, accreditation, and then with the trading platforms, anyone can load up any decarbonisation measure they're taking across the land. And we'll have to do industrial sequestration too. And whether CCS and hydrogen work or not, the North Sea is the best place in the world to try CCS. Empty holes, known geology, pipelines already in place. If it doesn't work in the North Sea, it won't work anywhere. And if we want to make a contribution to the global effort, we have an obligation to do that. And then there's R&D on top of that. You need to do the R&D. Governments need to be involved in the R&D, and that needs to be taken forward. So a carbon consumption focus, a carbon tax or carbon price, and you know, it's, not, it's not radical stuff. We already have a carbon price. Uh, and of course, we'll be out of the EU ETS on the 1st of January. So we've got a very and this consultation paid from the Treasury now on whether we have a carbon tax on the 1st of January or an emissions trading scheme on the 1st of January to replace the, the European system. We already have these things. Let's do it properly. And we must address the border. and We must address the trade issue so that we have genuine level playing field trade, not um, uh, uh, a, a distorted system that subsidizes polluters at the expense of those people trying to do the right thing. Now, if you bring that all together, what I set out in the, in the book is essentially what you do in each of the sectors. I won't bore you with the details of that now, but how you bring this stuff together in effectively a no regrets plan. So to put it in a nutshell, what I'm trying to do is to say, okay, if you unilaterally genuinely want, if the citizens of this country say it's our moral obligation that we at least will not have more climate change on our hands, if that's what you want to do, then I try to set out the least cost path to do that. And in the process, I try to point out that a headlong pursuit of net zero territorial carbon production has some quite perverse consequences and it won't address the objective that people have in mind. And um, I also want to point out that um, if people think that, you know, we're going to solve this problem by one more heave of the type of policies we had for the last 30 years, the last wasted 30 years, the last costly 30 years, then I'm afraid they're delusioned. And we can't afford 30 more wasted years. So I try in the book to say what you would have to do if you really wanted to achieve that unilateral objective. Of course, you might not want to do it. You might still want to go on a demonstration but sneak off on that flight for the cheap holiday. You might want to uh, go on the demonstration but ignore all the carbon in your carbon diary. And you might not want to pay the price of your pollution in effectively a carbon tax. That may well be the case. That may be why dem what democracy wants. But then don't pretend that you're going to actually address climate change. You know, it, it's one or the other. And currently, at two parts per million per annum being added, um, it's a path to a very hot world. So I hope my message is positive. I hope my message is this is practically how you do it. I hope it's more efficient than what's currently on offer. And I hope it injects a genuine realism. And I hope the Climate Change Committee will never tell us again that when we get to zero, 
which I hope we never will, it's net zero, not zero, that we will no longer be causing climate change, but rather they explain that you have to address the consumption rather than the production side. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you very much indeed. Please imagine a, a loud roar of applause. Uh, that was uh, fascinating, very clear as well. We have actually got loads of questions. I should just say to the viewers, you can um, click on the, the, the thumb up if you want to upvote a question. I'll probably try and start with the questions that have the most votes. I do have one of my own though before um, we get into those. Um, just to, to summarise your argument very quickly and tell me if I've got this wrong, I don't think I have because I was saying it was very clear. We, we have a problem which is that we're not on a global level reducing carbon dioxide emissions and in the process of trying to do this um, you know, domestically and only looking at our domestic production, we are wrecking a lot of our manufacturing industry. Um, so you are proposing that we need to measure our consumption of carbon as well as all the, the, the taxes and so on, but we our criteria needs to be based on uh, carbon consumption rather than carbon production. My question is simply, how do we actually calculate that? How do we work out the amount of carbon produced if we're buying some beef from Brazil as opposed to Argentina, as opposed to New Zealand or, or Scotland, or if we're getting some steel from uh, China or America? I mean, it, it sounds very difficult to do, very complex. Well, um, first, just a just correction. What I'm uh, focused on is the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. So even if you manage to reduce the emissions, you still got to address the sequestration side, which is the other side of the equation. So that's a really important part of my book. And it's also part of the work I've done with the Natural Capital Committee and my previous book on green and prosperous land about how you address those natural capital sides. So I don't want to lose that because it's not just about emissions. Now, when it comes to um, uh, trade, people say, oh, it's really difficult to work out exactly how much carbon's embedded in particular goods and services. So the answer to that question is, well, we do it in the UK. So in theory, it's not impossible. And in practice, it's very possible. We can apply a carbon tax in the UK. Nobody doubts that. We have an EU ETS. So it's just about differentials from different countries. Now, I'm a hopeless pragmatist. I would rather be roughly right than precisely wrong. So not to have any adjustment at the border is precisely wrong. Now, so where would, I do, where would I start? Well, I would start with the big ticket items in global trade. And it turns out that about five industries account for almost all of the, not almost all, but the vast bulk of carbon trade. Petrochemicals, aluminium, steel, fertilizer, um, and cement. Okay, so you don't have to do the whole lot from day one, and you don't have to diagnose exactly what's in a loaf of bread that comes from, from France or whatever. Start with the big stuff first. So if you look at countries of origin, um, and you think about what people declare on import certificates, if it comes from China, a good starting point is to say, well, 70% coal-based, that economy. So for those industries, we'll apply it as if the emissions reflect that energy balance in the system overall. It's only roughly right. If you want to claim as a, as a country exporting to us, your steel is not like that. It's produced in a special green plant. You prove it. Okay. But, you know, you, you know, in all sorts of these areas, think about how tariffs work. And they're not precise numbers. They are an attempt to roughly address a particular problem. I and mean, some of them are just protectionist. You know, uh, if you look at agricultural tariffs in Europe against the rest of the world, it's extraordinary. But, but I think this is perfectly practical. And by the way, it's not against WTO rules either. There's explicit allowance for environmental process. So, um, you know, we interfere in trade all over the place. Um, whether we like it or not, trade negotiations are currently of the essence. So it seems to me that it's perfectly possible to make some progress in the right direction. So I'm quite relaxed about that. And as for measuring consumption overall, well, you know, we do measure consumption in the British economy. <laughs> we have very good measures of this stuff. Uh, and we have statistical su surveys and so on that uh, the ONS carries out. I don't think that's particularly difficult. And indeed, if you look at the um, uh, net zero publication 
um, you will find, um, I think it's in the CCC document, about page 107, you'll see a graph. It's buried right in the middle or towards the end of the document, so no one, I think, notices so easily. It shows that carbon consumption, it actually shows a graph, which shows, I think, it's something like 50% higher than carbon production. But there is actually numbers and series for this uh, produced by BEZ already. Okay, great. All right, we've got over a dozen questions, so let's try and fire through as many as we can. Um, and the most upvoted one is a question I'm sure you've had before. What role do you think nuclear energy should play in tackling climate change? Um, I, I, I'm going to disappoint here. Um, I, I'm pretty neutral about this. You know, what I proposed in the Cost of Energy Review was not that uh, governments can decide whether they have this technology or not, but I proposed an equivalent firm power auction of all capacity in the economy, green and otherwise, either with a carbon tax so that the carbon's taken into account, or if it's not a two-stage auction. And I've set that out, and it's a way of bringing the renewables into the mainstream of uh, policy, recognising the intermittency, et cetera, in that process. Now, nuclear has to stand its, its position next to those other technologies. I readily admit that it's a political decision in the end because of the long life of the assets and the risks and the waste and so on um, that'll have to be taken. But uh, in the end, this is a question about which technologies within the system as a whole uh, can provide cost-effective outcomes. And the thing about nuclear, and I've written a paper on using RAP-based models for nuclear, the thing about nuclear is, I mean, it's a bit like, actually it is very like wind farms and, and um, uh, turbines. It's all fixed cost and zero marginal cost. So the cost of capital is absolutely everything. So I, I haven't said we should do nuclear and I haven't said we, we shouldn't. What I have worked on though, is if you do want to make nuclear, how do you make it as cheap and as efficient as possible? And if you look at Hinkley, how do you make a project as expensive as possible, get two effectively state-owned companies, a majority owned in EDF's case, and then provide them 9% real per annum for 35 years? You know, that's just extraordinary. And, um, you know, if the cost of capital was at three or four or five percent, then um, the economics of nuclear power would look radically different. But I don't like this idea of picking winners. Um, uh, I like the adage that losers pick governments. So I want as much market testing of this as we can possibly have. Well, that may be a very similar answer to the next question, and perhaps, which is uh, somebody you know, do sport fracking. Uh, any any further thoughts on that? Do I support fracking? So um, if you look at um, fracking technology, it has associated with it um, a number of pollution uh, outcomes, just like oil uh, and gas does, and especially coal. Right. So I want to make sure that any production of fossil fuels incorporates all the externalities in its costs. Okay. So the question is, A, is fracking more polluting or less polluting than other forms of fossil fuel production, given that we're going to consume fossil fuels for the next 30, 40 or 50 years anyway? Right? And um, uh, so I'm interested in that, and I'm interested in making sure that all that stuff is priced and regulated properly. Now, if you ask about the UK compared with the US, clearly in the US, circumstances are very different. This is a small, highly populated, geologically complex island. And the externalities on local communities, etc., are very large. Whereas if you look in the United States, there's whole areas of relatively empty country uh, where, uh, and, and very um, large scale geological structures. So even if there was a case for fracking in the United States, it may not be there's a case for fracking in the UK. And then finally, is fracking technology something you should ban? Absolutely not, because it enables you to optimise the existing oil and gas wells, as well as develop new fracked uh, 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 opportunities. So actually, it's a technology that's widely applied in conventional oil and gas and has been for a very long time. Right, thanks. Um, okay, the next question is, what impact do you think a carbon tax would have on low-income families? Hello? I briefly lost you for a moment. Sorry, yes, you did. Um, the question was, uh, what, what impact do you think a carbon tax would have on lower-income families? Um, 
the, the, the impact of a carbon tax uh, would um, have uh, distributional consequences across the board. And of course, that then feeds back into what you do with the revenues. So you have to carry the population with you. I think that everyone is facing a carbon tax already, including poor, poor, poorer families, which is paying for all the legacy costs and current costs of all the measures being taken to achieve the climate objective. So there's nothing special about the carbon tax in respect to poorer households. The question is, what is the distributional burden on uh, uh, poorer households of dealing with climate change? Again, okay, remember my point that if you don't have a carbon price, the other alternatives are probably going to be more expensive. Now, I think there are two parts to this. The first part is you can use the revenues to ameliorate some of these effects. But the second point is, anyway, there's a broader question about the price of electricity. Almost all the zero carbon technologies or low carbon technologies are zero marginal cost. So what you've got going on in the electricity market, energy markets, is the emaciation of wholesale markets. And eventually we'll end up with a world where the only market that really counts is capacity because electricity generation is like networks. It's just lumps of capital. And those have capacity or equivalent firm power or CFD contracts from which there is no escape by anyone. And that's a monopoly pricing system. And if you have a monopoly pricing system for fixed and sunk costs, you can choose who bears which part of those costs. Now, since the average household income is probably around 28,000, and given the coronavirus hit on top of the economic crash that was coming anyway, there is virtually no capacity in average or below average households to pay any more in energy bills. So you really are going to have to address the distributional element of this and who bears which part of the cost. But of course, any instrument requires adjustment. And I think the renewable subsidies, the smart meter costs, uh, the, the system develop, developments, etc., are already a serious distributional question for the poor. And the carbon tax just makes it explicit. Would you anticipate the carbon tax leading to the taxes being lowered in other areas? Or is all the revenue from the carbon tax going to go towards infrastructure and carbon capture and so on? Um, well, ideally, if you ask me what an optimal tax system is, an optimal tax system is one where we start with pollution pricing in a wide number of domains. We tax externalities, and then we work out what residual income we need at the end of the game. Whereas what we do in the UK and most developed countries, we start by taxing income, and then we tax sales, uh, so VAT and income tax. Then we try and tax wealth in various forms. Oh, and then we might have a pollution charge at the end, which is highly inefficient and distorting. But that said, be practical. Right now, governments are living massively beyond their means. I don't know anyone who thinks that the debt from the coronavirus is going to be paid back. And I think that you, if you're realistic, you know, there is a reckoning to come. And my great hope for carbon taxes in Britain is actually not that the government will be persuaded that these are the economically efficient thing to do, though that's the right reason. It's because they need the money. <laughs> and they've run out of virtually every other source of money. So I think that pollution taxes are coming just because government's going to be desperate for money and wait till the reckoning comes for all this debt from the lockdowns that we've imposed upon the economy. Yes, it doesn't bear thinking about it, really. OK, we have a question here from the Director General, Mark Littlewood. He says, uh, how much is the Extinction Rebellion movement a mix of street theatre, performative art, sorry, performance art, and a jolly day out, rather than a serious movement demanding specific policy change? Well, um, it's perfectly right and proper to criticise any uh, movement. But I think um, if you stand back, you know, why are so many people from very different walks of life supporting this? And I don't think most of the people who go on the demonstrations think that we can have net zero by 225. And I don't think many of the people who go on the demonstrations really agree with what some of the leadership of, of Extinction Rebellion suggests. But that doesn't disguise the fact that this is, in many respects, a democratic cry of protest against the lack of progress in respect to climate change. And so my view about Extinction Rebellion is, I think the objective of 225 is nonsense. 
I think many of the proposals are entirely impractical. I dislike the tactics that are used, um, uh, but I think that you should not conclude from that that what lies behind many people's willingness to demonstrate about these, these things is a genuine concern, and I would say a genuine moral concern. So I'm not in condemn mode, um, but I am in realism mode, um, and I think we should uh, take that into account. Do you think they're a good thing for the cause, or do you think they set things back and, and turn well, some people against it? As I understand it, this isn't really my field, but as I understand it, most of these big protest movements have a life cycle of about three years. They spontaneously appear, they become a major movement, and then they disintegrate internally. And you can see that's happening with regard to Extinction Rebellion at the moment. Um, the coronavirus clearly hasn't helped them. But I think in the early stages, they got a lot of people to ask the question, so what are you doing about climate change? And they have been uh, very challenging. I think if you put that alongside the ESG movement, which is disparate, poorly measuring these things, etc., you've got a lot of pressures all coming together, which means that there is virtually no company and very few individuals who are not forced to ask the question, so what are you doing about climate change? And I think that's for the good, because I think this is one of the great threats. I wish it was true about biodiversity. In other words, I wish Extinction Rebellion were as, was as vocal about the destruction of our natural environment as they are about climate change. But I, I'm not in condemn mode. I'm a Democrat. I like the right to protest. I like to try to read the lessons when major protest movements start. But I don't necessarily have to agree with them. OK, we have a question from Sheldon which is if we do trade deals with other countries such as Australia on agricultural products, will we be increasing our carbon footprint by importing these agricultural products? Well, it, it's very interesting. So when it comes to agriculture, uh, we have all these screams about uh, environmental standards uh, and welfare standards. I mean, of course, it assumes our welfare standards are in fact higher everywhere than elsewhere. And that actually isn't quite as clear as some people and some farming lobbies would pretend. But we have all these claims about this. Um, uh, and we have government ministers jumping up and down immediately and saying, you know, any trade deal, we're not lowering welfare standards, we're not lowering environmental standards. Well, that's quite a statement. OK. And of course, almost all trade agreements start and end with agriculture, with the other things in between, because agriculture is such a politically uh, substantive issue in the United States, in, in uh, Europe, in the UK, and in Australia and New Zealand. So they're all up there uh, as big issues. My view is that um, uh, there's a great distinction between free trade and fair trade. I'm interested in level playing field, economically efficient, fair trade. And therefore, I think externality should be priced. And therefore, I think it would be very odd if you were to import beef from uh, uh, Brazil, grown on cleared rainforest, and that would be displaced British beef production at home. That said, uh, that doesn't mean that British agriculture will somehow be immune from world trade. If you look at the British landscape, you look at the patchwork quilt, you look at the diverse geology, you look at the small field size, most of British agriculture is globally uncompetitive, full stop. You know, how do you compete with the grain uh, prairies of the Ukraine, uh, of the Midwest, United States, etc.? We just don't have that kind of landscape. And so the practical questions about trade are how to get fair trade, how to get good prices for British consumers, and how at the same time to use the opportunity given that agriculture contributes so little to GDP, to manage our land for much better social, environmental and economic gain. And that's a fantastic opportunity. And as for food security, I mean, you know, this is an argument that farmers always trot out. OK, two things to say. Uh, the first one is, you know, we're not going to be starved into a submission during a war. The cyber system will be taken out in five minutes and the electricity system will go down long before we starve to death from the convoys. 
And the second thing to say is that um, uh, when it comes to um, the content of uh, security of supply, the uh, demonstration for the coronavirus episode and lockdown is how fantastically good our food chains are. You give them the greatest shock you could possibly imagine, full lockdown, and all the major economies in the world do it simultaneously. And you know what? The only thing is we get short of is a few particular items of salads at that time of the salad drought in the Western Hemis in the Northern Hemisphere, and almost all the rest of the food chain function. So we've got pretty good food security. And I would discount that part of the argument, not the environmental bit. Uh, we've got about seven minutes left and I'm going to give you no more than two minutes to answer this question because it is, if you had two minutes with the Prime Minister, what would you advise him to do? I would say get on with a carbon tax and a carbon border tax. Now you've got a consultation paper out from the Treasury where that's one of the three options post EUTS on the 1st of January. You already have a carbon price anyway through the EUTS. Do it, do it now. It's the greatest moment of opportunity that has been in the carbon pricing space in the last 30 years and probably for the next 10. So do it. Okay. Now a question from Andy Mayer, which is, let me read this properly, a major argument against carbon tariffs is tit for tat social tariffs. Our net zero regime on manufacturing exports becomes China's tranquility tax on media exports. All tariffs have this reciprocation problem why do you believe this would be different? Well, all, all, all countries have issues in respect of um, their trading prices and terms. Uh, the world is not actually um, comprised of many commodities which are genuinely free trade anyway. And um, uh, in this particular case, there is an absolutely clear rationale. And in this respect, the Paris architecture is excellent. Uh, China is a signatory. As, are, uh, as is the EU and now us separately uh, to that convention. Um, and we would be introducing carbon price in order to achieve the global agreement uh, to reduce those emissions. So I don't see it a problem. If it's in other areas, you can see it's much more difficult about tariffs, you know, uh, protecting Welsh farmers and their sheep uh, because of social reasons, etc. Uh, interfering, and there's massive interference in... Um, uh, cyberspace and information technologies. You can see a host of reasons in that territory, and I'm in those territories very much in the free trade block, box, fair trade box. But carbon straightforward. There's a treaty, there's a UN framework, China's a signatory. We're putting together our um, uh, offers for the next uh, period up to 230. And um, yeah, I don't see a problem. Uh, and if there is a problem, you know that China isn't serious about climate change. Okay. It's getting a bit dark, by the way, now. Uh, Dieter, I don't know if you've got a lamp you can put on, but yeah, I, I sorry. might have to, Give me might a have to use electricity at some point. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, it's, um, it's, the, it's past the equinox and the nights are drawing in and maybe yeah. I'm just fading away. <laughs> yes, it's very depressing. Um, I've got a question here about... Um, the impact of lockdown on carbon emissions, which I think was at one point about 8% down uh, what it normally is. And the question is, does the evidence of the impact of lockdown on carbon emissions, which is minimal, give any indication of the sheer impossibility of getting to net zero? Okay, so, so uh, several points. First of all, I focus on carbon concentration in the atmosphere, right? That's the only measure that matters. That's the composition of our atmosphere which has the greenhouse effect, et cetera. So emissions can temporarily fall and have no impact on uh, parts per million in the atmosphere. And that's precisely what's happened, okay? So there is a short-term fall in emissions. It's very sharp. Why wouldn't it be if you stopped all the world economies simultaneously? Um, but it hasn't made much difference to the carbon concentration in the atmosphere. The second thing is the bounce back is incredibly quick. So China's emissions are higher now for the relative time uh, uh, compared with last year and um, they were already there back I think in June so this is an incredibly short term blip but what it does tell you is if you simply want to crunch demand you won't get there anytime soon and actually you won't be able to crunch demand anyway unless you do something draconian of this form 
What it tells you is it's the composition of production to support that carbon consumption, which is really going to have to change. And, you know, you know in, in, the, in the scheme of things, if China burns half the world's coal and it carries on burning the volume of coal it's burning, we're going to fry. And that's China plus India plus Africa is where climate change is ultimately going to be addressed and solved or not. A billion extra people in each of those areas by 2100, that's the three billion extra roughly. Uh, the African growth rate is phenomenal. Um, India is coming up very fast. Uh, China may have slowed down a bit. So that's where the action is. A lockdown doesn't really tell you anything much because it's temporary. The 2007, 2008 uh, financial crisis made no difference whatsoever to the pathway of emissions concentration in the atmosphere. What we have to do is make sure we are not contributing to encouraging emissions to be even higher in China, India and Africa. Whether we'll do that or not is a moot question, but at the end of my book, I raise the question, what happens if nobody else does? And that's why my policies that I propose are almost all genuinely no regret. And I haven't gone into that in this discussion, but the other ancillary benefits of the policies I suggest, including the preference of, of taxing carbon rather than taxing um, things that uh, are benign to the economy, all of those things fit together in a sensible economic policy. Splendid. Right. That brings us right up to time. So um, I don't know if you've got a copy of your book you can hold up, but it's called Net Zero, How We Stop Causing Climate Change. Available it's Harper Collins, so it should be available everywhere. Um, I guess at the moment you more like to buy it online, uh, even if you're not anyway. But yeah, Net Zero by uh, Professor Dieter Helm. Uh, go out and buy it, give it a good review on Amazon. Um, we will be back. I'm not sure what our next event is, but there's bound to be one on the horizon not too far off. Uh, don't forget, folks, that we are a privately funded charity. We take no money from the government. If you like what you see, if you want to enjoy our output, whether it's uh, audio, visual, or uh, in terms of literature, do chuck us a few shillings, whatever you can afford, everything is much appreciated. But thank you very much for um, tuning in with this. And thank you, especially, of course, to uh, Professor Helm for really a very fascinating, very thought-provoking uh, discussion and, uh, and talk. And I will be going out and, uh, and reading that book myself. Okay, everybody, take care. Have a good evening. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you for listening. Thank you.